Gracious Lord, we thank you for the great privilege of reading your word in our own language and meeting together, Lord, to study it. Give us grace, Holy Spirit, to understand your truth tonight. Give us grace, Lord, not just to hear, but to hear and take action, to take action in obedience and faith. Help us to grow as we bear your, the name of your great Son, Lord, to bring you great honor and glory. Amen. All right, well, welcome. This is uh, Lesson 5, and uh, we're going to be in Ecclesiastes 3. But before that, I wanted to make a couple of kind of tie together things uh, uh, from last week's lesson. Uh, last week, we were talking about the dead end of materialism and the prophet, as Solomon, uh, was concerned about what, he was, what was going to happen to his, uh, his wealth when he died, right? What was he, you remember what his big concern was? It was only last week. Who's he going to pass all my wealth on to? You know, and we talked about uh, Rehoboas and his son, and I just wanted to clear up, you know, I was not, you know, we were talking about questions about your uh, children. I was not calling my, wife, my, my children an idiot uh, or idiots or anything like that. My, I'm, I'm blessed. My kids are very responsible with money and possessions. But I wanted, I wanted to clear that up. I don't know. They may be watching, but they may be watching. But I wanted to clear that up. I was not making any allegations toward my own kids. We were talking about Solomon and Rehoboam. Okay, I want to clear that up. So, so the last couple of weeks here. So, um, two weeks ago, uh, the prof, the preacher set off on this search, and he and he went down the path of wisdom and said that it's all vanity. He went down the path of, ult of pleasure and all these different forms, and what did he say? It's vanity. And last week, he went down the trail of materialism. What's, I got all my stuff. I got to have my stuff, right? And what did he say? What did he say? It's all vanity, okay? Well, now he's going to shift gears here, and we're going to talk about time. I asked you last week, look at your watch, and we talk about what time it is. So we're going to look at now... In this part of the book, there's a poem, the first poem. There's another poem later about time in Ecclesiastes 3. And this may be one of the most famous parts of Ecclesiastes. Um, remember the song, Turn, 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 uh, in 1965? The, there we go. Thank you, Brenda. We got, we got the music there. So the, the Pete Seeger and the Birds... Um, uh, recorded the song "Turn, Turn, Turn," and they quote most of the scripture that we're going to read tonight. It was it was actually an anti-Vietnam War song. It was a, it was talking about you know we got to have peace instead of war. Uh, but the very famous song. But we're going to talk about change and time, and we're also going to talk about what doesn't change over time. So some questions just to kind of get you thinking here. Um, you know, how have times changed during your lifetime? Most of us, we're here in 1965, let's just say. So what, what's changed since 1965 when the song was put out? Technology changes. Anything else? We've changed physically, right? We've changed physically. Our cultural standards have changed a whole lot. You know, people in 65 would probably never imagine we'd be talking about some of the things that we're talking about. Right? They'll have religious standards. Religious interpretations, religious standards, yep. How we do church, right? How we sing. How we sing, what we sing. Yeah. Well, I can remember a time when churches had nothing but hymnals. Now we read it up on the screen. Yep. All paper hymnals. I sat with my grandmother, and before church, we'd tear off pieces of the program and mark the hymnal where the songs were going to be, right? We don't do that much anymore. Bring it. Yeah, 
bring physical Bible versus read it on a on a on a cell phone, perhaps. Yep. Okay, so you've seen these changes. Um, is God sovereign over the times? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that tonight. To what degree is God sovereign over the times? And um, um, the other thing we're going to talk about tonight, why do things cycle? Uh, you know, the old deal that uh, you know, history repeats itself, right? The idea, have, you seen, have you seen things cycle in your lifetime, perhaps? Clothing, clothing fads do sometimes, right? Okay. Um, another question here to get you thinking is... Um, is God and His wisdom sufficient when times change? Okay. Uh, most people are nodding that God's sufficient when times change. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. Um, you know, one, one of the upshots of this, and that he talks about as we go on through the book, is the uncertainty of life. The certainty of death, but the uncertainty of life. And uh, I'll just tell us a little story on myself. I was a young pup and thought I had some control over my life. You know, I, was, I knew I was going to get transferred, and I tried to influence where I was going to get transferred. And more or less, I, from where, where we were at at the time, I was saying south and west, and it ended up they sent me north and east. So we spent two years in Connecticut, and I did not want to go there. But as it, in the whole, as Liz and I look back, that was one of the best times of our lives, the two years that we spent in Connecticut. God blessed us in many, many ways there. But I wasn't smart enough to see it uh, at the time, and, and I, had to, I had to learn some things to adapt to that. So we're going to talk about here God's a God of beginnings and endings, right? And, and we're going to get to this with this idea of time tonight. And we will have beginnings and endings Look back over your life and think about uh, different seasons of your life, beginnings and endings in life. Uh, it's easy to see sometimes when you're changing jobs or you're changing locations, you can kind of mark those times in your life. But there may be other beginnings and endings in your life to think about as we go through this. <coughs> All right, so let's read this, and we're going to start out and read Ecclesiastes 3. 1 through 8. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven, a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. A time to search and a time to give up as lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate time for war, and a time for peace. It's a magnificent poem, isn't it? Magnificent poem. One, one of the difficulties I talked about in the first week, as people interpret the book, it changes genre, right? So we went from a narrative where he's talking about how he's seeking pleasure and all this stuff, and now he's going to shift gears and he's going, and he's going to talk to us with a poem. So look at verse 1 there. It's an amazing statement. There is an appointed time for everything, and there is a time for every event under heaven. Now, I told you in the first week that one of the difficulties of Ecclesiastes is his contradictions of himself. And what, what did he tell us back in... in uh, 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 chapter 1. You remember? That uh, 
a generation come, goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets. He goes on. So there's nothing new under the sun. And he's talked about, he's going to talk a lot more about this later in the book. But one of the issues he's raising now is, is the creation and events under the sun. They don't change. Or, you know, they're, they're in motion and all this is going on under the sun. Now he's going to talk about times. He's going to talk about how there's seasons. And he's going to talk about how there's a time to give birth and there's a time to die. Doesn't that imply change? Okay, so he's saying there's going to be changes. But he's told us already that under the sun, everything, there's nothing new under the sun. Well, this isn't new. How, how do these fit together? This isn't new. And by that, I mean, he's saying there's a time to give birth and a time to die. That's consistent. That's throughout time, all the way. So it's not really new. It's just a philosophy on what he's talking about. Okay. Well, it, but you can see kind of two ideas here. One's the idea that the creation under the sun, damaged by sin as it is, God has it and it's just in motion, right? And it keeps the, the rivers run, they run into the sea, and the sea doesn't overflow, right? That just keeps going. Now he's telling us there's an appointed time for everything, and there's a time for every event under the sun. So the, the thing to think about here is these changes that we just read through, a time for birth, a time to die. These are changes. These are changes that are going on in, in human society, right? I put in your notes there, 61 million people died last year and 134 million people were born. Those were events that are going on in, under the sun, okay? A time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal. These are changes in the seasons. Time as a season here. And in all of this, God's claiming that he's sovereign over it. There's an appointed time for everything. Don't we, don't we wrestle with this? All right. Does this world, you read your, again, you know, read your news. Does this world look like it's under control, like things are planned, like things are going according to a plan? Under the sun, it looks like chaos. It looks like chaos. The, the chaos that we talked about, the, the madness of sin and folly, right? You talked about in the last chapter. Now he's telling us there's an appointed time for everything, and there's a time for every event under heaven. So these, these, think of these things that we just read in the list now as processes, as processes. Giving birth, dying, planting, killing, healing, tearing down, time to build up. God's going to use, <coughs> excuse me, the cedar is almost over. God's going to use all of these processes as we go through life in our life, uh, as part of this, we are going to experience these things as we go through life under the sun. So the good news here, God says there's an appointed time for all these things. Can you look back in your life? See, it's a lot easier looking back than when you're in the middle of something, right? When you look back, you can see how one thing fit together with another thing and another time in your life prepared you for something else that was coming in your life. I, don't, I, can, I can see some of those things very clearly now that I sure couldn't see in the middle of the fracas. But there's an appointed time here. And, and look at the extremes. There's birth and there's death. There's planting and there's uprooting, killing, healing, weeping, laughing, laughing throwing stones, gathering stones. These opposites, these opposites. And these would seem also to kind of imply cycles, like we saw again back in Ecclesiastes 1, the cycles of, of, the cre of what's going on in the creation. These are cycles that God uses at different times in our life experience. So God works in these seasons. And, and as you read through this list, 
is there any promise of equilibrium or things being static? There's nothing in here that says there's a time when everything's just going to be smooth as glass and everything, nothing's going to change, nothing, right? There's no promise of that here. And don't we sometimes get complacent, you know, things are going good, and then something changes, somebody moves, some, you know, something goes on, and we get all upset about it. Like somehow the sky is falling and the world's coming down on our head. What he's saying here, there's, it's almost never in our lives going to be static. There's always going to be something going on. One of these processes is going to be touching our lives one or more, usually it's more than one, right? The, the God's going to be using these processes in our lives. We're going to be encountering these things. I've always heard, and it's pretty true, when you think life is going like this and everything is just comfortable, you got to look out because that's going to come above. It doesn't last long. It doesn't last yeah, long. equilibrium doesn't last long, right? That's what he's telling us here in this poem. A time to tear apart, a time to sew together. A time to be silent and a time to speak. I need, I need to be a more discerning of when it's time to be silent. And a time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Earlier we talked a couple times about the biblical concept of wisdom is it's applying the fear of the Lord in a situation. Now, one of the interpretations of this book is that it was used to train people for government service. And we'll, and we'll see in later chapters you know, a little more of this. But one of the things that would be important for if you were training somebody to be in a position of responsibility is that they can understand the situation. They have a sense and ability to interpret the situation, to know what to do or what to say. And you, you think of some people in Scripture that, had a, that were good at this, at being able to understand the situation or the times. I'll, I'll offer up Daniel, Joseph, Esther. Esther, for such a time as this, right? This, this idea of ability, ability to understand what's going on and know how to apply God's wisdom in the situation. So this is a book of wisdom. So part of our challenge is to, is to grow in your wisdom so that you can discern what these times are, so you can discern um, what's going on around you at a given time. Uh, there's Proverbs, I didn't, I didn't write them down, but if you go back in the book of Proverbs, one of the attributes of the fool who rejects God's wisdom is that he doesn't know what time it is. He just blunders on into whatever um, calamity he's going to blunder into. Whereas God's people, fearing the Lord, um, one of my favorite uh, Proverbs, uh, the wise man seeth trouble far and hideth himself. It's the same idea here as what he's trying to teach us here with, the, with this poem about time. The wise man can see the situation and can respond to it in a wise way. The wise man seeth trouble afar off and hideth himself when there's trouble coming. Well, part of our challenge is to be able to discern these times. When is it time to throw stones? When is it time <coughs> to gather stones? One I have difficulty with, a time to search and a time to give up is lost. Um, I have trouble giving up things as lost, uh, for better or worse. But um, being ha able to have the discernment to know um, what to do in a given situation is the idea here. The good news here is that in verse 1, there's a time for every event under heaven. So in this crazy world that's full of vanity, that's full of absurdity, there's a certainty here that even as, as confused and messed up as whatever it is around us, 
God's in sovereign control over what the situation is. And you remember the, um, we talked about Job, and when Job faces off with God in, in Job 38, and God tells him, where were you? Okay. In other words, how can you, how can you question my authority and my sovereignty when you have, weren't around at the creation and you haven't seen the whole story? We're in the same boat, are we not? We see all this going around us. God tells us that these things are going to be going on around us here that we just read, these seasons of time. And we're in the same boat. We aren't, God hasn't given us his perspective. And also, like we've seen, life is short, death is certain. We don't get to see beyond our life how God's going to play these things out. So we don't get to have God's perspective of eternity. We only get our little, you know, our little shift, if you will, in the whole timeline, and we don't get to understand how what was our what was going on with our ancestor we've talked about. And God's going through these seasons, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing. What was going on with our ancestors that's playing out in our life? And what's going on in our life with a time to um, embrace and a time not to embrace that's going to affect our generations to come. We don't, we don't get to see those things. So we're in this pickle, so to speak, where we only get to see what's going on immediately around us or within our lifetime. And when God says he's got it in control, that he's sovereign, but he doesn't reveal these things to us. I didn't, I won't take you there, but I, I put Isaiah 40, 28 in the, in the notes there. And God very clearly says that he's constant. Think of the magnificent of a constant God and how he can use all these things of change to accomplish his will. It's like a master artist. It's like a master craftsman using different tools at different times to accomplish his will. I've never, I don't know if you've ever thought of life like that as God works on us and puts us through situations and and that he's, he's in control of them, even when we feel like sometimes we can't even see him or don't feel his control. And yet he's accomplishing his will through these, through these seasons, through these processes. But we don't, we just, in our little finite mind, we can only see here. And I guess we just think, why God are you taking me? Am I going through this? I can't see any good that could come out of this. And um, I may never see it, is what I have realized. But I question his sovereignty sometimes. I'll give, you, I'll give you a little small example that illustrates that. When we got transferred to Michigan, um, my daughter was a sophomore in high school. And she thought I had ruined her life. And she was loudly proclaimed that, in fact, that I had ruined her life. And two years later, when she graduated, she said it was the best thing that ever happened to her. And, and there were a lot of good things there. But it's exactly what Sadie's saying. Sometimes these things happen, these things come into our lives. You get to choose any of these seasons. You might get to influence them a little bit. In most cases, we don't have any human agency over these things. And God works these things for good. He tells us that, right? Romans 8, 28, all things are going to work together for God, for in God's purposes, right? Well, James says, consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, <coughs> knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I was going to have us go look at that at the end of the lesson. Thank you. It's perfect. But so, so Paul's really already kind of taught the rest of the lesson here. But this ability, this ability in faith to trust God in his sovereignty as he uses these things in our lives, and the New Testament says even to be able to count them as joy as you go through these things. It's very hard. 
<laughs> yep, yep. So um, th this next section here, I call it changing times, call for faith in God and his goodness. And so let's look at 9 through 11. What profit is there to the worker from that in which he toils? I've seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. So this question about profit, uh, profitability, <coughs> this, again, go back to the first lesson we talked about. One of the interpretations of the book is it's asking the question of what profit is there in life, in this absurd, vain life that we live in, you know, the situation under the sun. So if there's all this uncertainty, we just got through reading there, all, you know, the time for this, time for that, time for this, time for that, all this uncertainty, and you can't control it. You can't control it. We just talked about that. So what's the point? Where, where should, why should I have any ambition? Right? Wouldn't it be better just to lay in the bed and pull the covers over my head? Right? And, and don't, don't you hear that in people's response, particularly when they get stressed out in a very complicated situation? I just give up. I'm going to go run off and hide in a cave somewhere. <coughs> There's a proverb I wanted to show you. Um, proverb 26, uh, 13 to 14. I, I love this proverb. You can't say God doesn't have humor here. This is Proverbs 26, uh, 13. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. A lion is in the open square. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. I don't know if you've ever had teenagers, but what, when it's time to get up and do work, just roll over in the bed, right? As the, as the, as the uh, uh, door turns on its hinges, the sluggard turns on his bed, right? This is the idea here, what the Proverbs talking about. You can make up all kinds of reasons about not doing anything, right? There's a lion in the road. There, you know, the, the sky is falling. There's, there's, there's things I can't predict. There, you know, this terrible thing could happen. Don't we have these voices around us right now? The, um, you know, the world's going to get so hot and everything's going to just go to pieces and et cetera, et cetera. There's a lion in the road. And that's what this question's about. What profit is there to the worker in all that he does, in all of his toils? Right? Because you got, um, my cousin's coming here. He's a farmer, right? So there's drought. There's hail. There's tornadoes. Uh, all this stuff. You know, I, you know, I don't get too enough rain. I get too much rain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What profit is there <coughs> in all this unpredictability? That's a legitimate question. But look at verse 10 here. I've seen the task which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. He's given us work to do. He's given us work to do. One of the themes of the book, we, we bumped into it um, in the last, uh, I believe it was last week, this idea that God has given us a lot in life. He's given each of us a lot in life, a situation a situation and a set of opportunities, and um, we're supposed to do good with it. And that's what he's talking about here. I've seen the task, the lot, which God has given the sons of men with which to occupy themselves. Even in all this unpredictability, God has given us work to do. Um, look over New Testament, Ephesians 2. Uh, most Ephesians 2.10 <coughs> For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. God's given you a job to do in this short time that we're on the earth. What did he give Adam and Eve to do back in Genesis 1? Bear my image, tend the gar garden. Bear my image, tend the garden. Well, we've got about the same thing. Bear my image, tend the garden, where I, wherever I put you in the garden. Get busy, right? So we're not to just be the sluggard on the bed and just roll over and cover our heads here. Now, the, um, so there's a, a point behind all this. And we, he's already told us here, there's an appointed time for all these things. God's going to use these things appropriately in our lives. There's a purpose behind these things, right? Because a lot of the argument against God and against Christianity is there's randomness, right? We're all just, we're all just random stardust and somehow everything uh, happened and animals came about and humans came out of animals, right? It was all this randomness. There's no predictability. There's no purpose in creation. Well, he's going to challenge that. <coughs> he's made everything appropriate in its time. And look at this statement. He has also set eternity in their heart, the hearts of men, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. Wow. This, this is big stuff. He's made everything appropriate in its time. The changes that God has brought in your life, he has he sovereignly constructed these things, even though they may appear random to us. Where in the world did this come from? Why did that happen? Why did it have to be like this? Uh, why does somebody not like me? Uh, I didn't do anything to them, right? All these things are random. They look like random things. He has made everything appropriate in its time. There's purpose, appropriate in its time. There's purpose. Even, even in this absurd, vain-filled world under the sun, God's still at work. He has purpose, and everything's appropriate in this time. Again, it's hard. It's hard by, you have to claim that by faith. When you look around you, again, read the news. Does it look like purpose and sovereign, sovereign control of God in every one of these situations? It's hard to see it. It's hard to see it. But Scripture says he's made everything appropriate in his time. And look at that next. What does that mean? He also said eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. What does that mean? Do you have eternity in your heart? <coughs> Let me take again back to Genesis 1. Was Adam created from one of the animals? How was he created? By, and God shaped him specifically different from the animals. Okay? He wasn't just created. He was, Adam is a spiritual being. Man is a spiritual being. He's not just the dust of the earth. God brought him to life, it, you know, put his breath on him, right? Okay? So he has put eternity in their heart. Man is a spiritual being which means you have eternity in your heart. You may want to deny it. You know, there's people that deny that and say, you know, death comes, it's all over, I'm just annihilated, poof, I'm gone, I never, you know, like I never was. No, you're an eternal being, and God has put eternity in your heart to know him. Had sin not come, Adam and Eve <coughs> stood in their heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, this, I'm not going to chase it, but this is what a lot of the first part of Romans is talking about, how the, 
creation is screaming out to mankind, God is a creator, repent and turn to his son uh, to be saved. But eternity in our hearts. But the trick here is God hasn't revealed everything to us. You know, we all, we've got all kinds of questions. Why, God, why did you do this? Why didn't you do it this way? Uh, maybe someday he'll give us some of those answers. You know, Job was after some of those answers. So that man may, will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning to the end. Doesn't that frustrate you? you can, he's not granted us, he's not revealed to us the beginning from the end. From the creation to the... We, we get a little bit of it in Scripture. We're told a little bit of what's to come when he finishes redeeming the earth and everything. But we don't get the picture of why he did this then and this then and why Sadie got shipped off to Texas and, you know, uh, why I, we got shipped off to Connecticut and Michigan. Um, yeah, there was an answer in terms of work and everything. But the spiritual purposes behind those things weren't obvious at all to us when they happened. So this is the part of the quandary we're in. These, God's using the times and the seasons to accomplish His will, but He doesn't necessarily feel, you know, say, oh, by the way, Paul, next week this is going to begin in your life, and here's why I'm doing it, and it's going to last this long. You're not going to get an email like that. It can be overwhelming. Changes in our lives, right? You said we wouldn't know what to do with it if you gave us only the details. That wouldn't be a good thing. Can you think think about what life would be like if you knew when you were born the date of your death was tattooed on your arm? You knew that you only had so many days, right? It'd make life a lot different. Right? If God revealed that kind of detail in what he's going to do in our lives. It's kind of scary. But uh, so I guess in a way I'm thankful he's left these things a mystery. There's some things I don't want to know about what's coming. Right? If, you, if you knew some of the things you were going to have to have faced in life, what would you, you know, you just want to pull the covers over your head. I'm just not going there, right? But God's going to take us through these things for His sovereign glory. Do you think we will, uh, when we get to heaven, will we understand why all of that happened and all or it won't matter? You know, I, I've wondered about that, like why God did this or took that or didn't do this. And uh, I wondered if it will even matter when I get to heaven. Um, I don't know. I, I, you know, that's a hard question to just speculate on. Yeah. And we, and we read, I, I put it in here before, the verse in Deuteronomy 29, 29, where God says the secret things are His. Uh, the other one I want to show you, uh, it kind of goes to this, this thought, though. Uh, Proverbs 25, 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. The glory of kings is to search out a matter. God doesn't always reveal things to us, right? But he's put eternity on our hearts to try to learn about them and understand them. So how much he's going to reveal to us and when, um, I don't know. There are people in the Bible I'd like to sit down and talk to. There's people in history I'd like to sit down and talk to. Uh, and well, how was it? Why did you do that? You know, and they'll probably ask me, "Well, why did you do that?" Right? <coughs> but we don't get to know those things. But the point is, there's eternity in our hearts. Now, let's let's go on here. Um, I, I wanted to read this to you. Uh, Psalm 103:19. This is just kind of a confidence builder here. 
The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. So in all the madness, all the absurdity, all the vanity, God rules over all. Even when he's having us gather stones and throw stones and people are dying and people being birthed, God's sovereign over all those things. All right, so let's, let's chug on here and let's read, uh, finish up and we'll read 12 to 14. I know that there is nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all of his labor. It is a gift of God. Have you heard this before? It's only been a week, folks. It's only been a week. No, 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 no. Um, uh, it's only been a week, uh, but we read this uh, before. And he's going to tell this to us again and again and again as we go through the book. We don't know how God's sovereign, but he hadn't revealed all these details to us. There's all this unpredictability. These seasons are changing, and we're going through these seasons. And it looks like madness and chaos sometimes. But God says he's sovereign over the whole thing. And what's your act of faith and worship? How do you fear God in the middle of all this? I know that there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and to do good in one's lifetime. Remember we just read in Ephesians 2, He's prepared works, good works for you to do. Works, that's what he's talking about, and to do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all of his labor. It is a gift of God. So in all the vanity and all the absurdity, to be able to, be able to in faith, say, God's given me this to do. I'm going to do my very best at it. He's given me these pleasures to enjoy and the ability to enjoy them. We read before that the ability to enjoy these pleasures is God's gift. All this is a gift by God's hand. It's grace. It's grace. In all this vanity, in all this madness, to be able to live life in, in this faithful, worshipful style and thank God for what he's given us and to take pleasure in what he's given us, right? Knowing that we don't know how much life we've got ahead of us, to live with that uncertainty and to be able to take the moment and, and, and live in, in the pleasure of what God has given you and to take pleasure in that. That's an act of faith. Any questions on that? Well, I, I So compare that to the verse I read you about the fool, sluggard in the bed, mm -hmm. right? I'm just going to, life is too complicated, it's too dangerous, there's a lion in the street, so I'm just going to pull the cover over my head and do nothing. <clears throat> Versus rejoicing and doing good in one's lifetime and that you eat and drink and see good in all of your labor and join that as a gift of God. Completely different attitude. Thank you. Look at um, 1 Corinthians 10.31. It's kind of summed up another way. Whether then you eat or drink, right? And that what the preacher's been talking to us about, how you eat and drink, or whatever you do, those works in your life, do all to the glory of God. So it's the same, you know, it's just a different way of saying the same things as what the preacher's telling us here. Um 
you know, I, I put the note in there about Genesis 3. That's, that's where Adam and Eve get the curse, right? And Adam's going to have to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. And even in all that, we can say, we can take pleasure in the gift of the labor that God's given us and the gift of the, of the pleasures that he's given us in life. So God's faithful in changing times. Let's wrap up and we'll look at verse 14 here. I know that everything God does will remain forever. There's nothing to add to it, and there's nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should, if you're tracking with me, what's it say next? That men should fear him, revere, revere him. You might have honor him. So what's God's purposes? He, he, you know, he, he's, he's taken us through in this section of Scripture, this poem we read. God's sovereign over all these things, all these events, these, these seasons of time. We've read all these different seasons of time. And they're, they're like extremes, right? Gather stones, throw stones, birth, die. What's God's purposes in all of those things? Verse 14. So that men would fear him. So that men would fear him. Um, a lot of us are reading through Genesis right now. Would you say that men were fearing God when Noah had to build the boat, the ark? Would you say the men were fearing God when the Tower of Babel was built and God had to disperse them because of la with language? We don't on our own fear God. Given to ourselves, we are not going to fear God. He's got to help. He's got to bring us to Himself. So Jesus said that the Father may draw them unto me. That the Father has to draw them unto me. God use has a purpose, his big purpose behind all these um, uncertainty and changing times and all this stuff. He's going to manage creation, human society with all these changes, but he's going to accomplish his will that men might fear him. Well, in Revelation, that's what happened to the Jewish nation. It was only a small number left. And they see what God has done, and they start crying for the Messiah. It leads them to repentance, right? To call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Because they're afraid of what's going to happen from the Lord God. Yeah. Fear of judgment. Mm -hmm. Fear of judgment, okay? But think, again, I, you know, everybody's got a little different story, but how God brought changes into your life through seasons, different changes in times, and maybe use different people as part of that to bring you to the fear of the Lord, to help you to come to a point of, of repenting and confessing Christ, to be saved. So God, this is, this is the big upshot here for, you know, this wasn't in the song, turn, 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 right? He didn't, he didn't get, he left this part off, right? All these changes in seasons of times that God is, a, is sovereign over, that he's appointed, have a purpose. And that's that men would fear him. That men would repent and fear him as, as God and creator. So all this vanity, in the midst of all this vanity and chaos because of sin, this is a different picture. This, this is like kind of looking behind the I don't know, Wizard of Oz, where you're getting to see the, the, you know, what's going on behind the curtain here. God's at work, even in all the uncertainty, in all the changes, to bring about His will, that men would fear Him. Not all men are going to fear Him. Jesus said the road is narrow. But He's bring, bringing all these changes and times in our lives to ultimately bring us to Himself, that we might fear Him. Bless God. More, they go through, they turn more, more the harder, yeah, right? You, so men, men have a choice about how they're going to respond. 
in, in, in uh, you know, some kind of a problem or tribulation? Are you going to call on the name of the Lord or are you going to harden your heart and turn away? And we see both, right? Okay. Well, that's about the times here. Um, so some questions for you to think about. You know, tonight, if you worry that God's going to abandon you or fail you in changing times, call on Christ tonight. If you've not repented and trusted Christ, let this be, let's be, you know, as you think about the, the, the difficulties of life and the complexity of it, repent and be saved tonight. Um, you know, I'd ask you to think about discernment of times and seasons. What's, what's God doing in your life now? What season is he, what, you know, which one of these things has he got going on in your life? How should you be responding? What is the wisdom you should be applying in that situation? This is a call to be faithful even in our work, even as time changes. The situations change around us to take wise actions. It's a call to be content. You know, he talked about the gift to be able to take pleasure in what God's given us. It's a, it, we, we've talked about this almost every week, this idea of being contented in what, in what God's that's given that's us. That's one of the positive things about the times that we are living, that nobody seems content with their lives. You know, they're reaching for something more, more, and more, and more, and they're seeking that, and they can't find it because they're not looking at that country western zone looking for all love, love in all the wrong places. places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's, that's probably a good description. Well, let's think about that for a second because when you think of the Old Testament, Abraham, Joseph, and the rest, they always obtained more and more and more, and they were glorified by God, I mean, in their day, because they were extremely wealthy people. Not one of those people were, were poor or, or destitute. Even Job, at his lowest, when he was out of everything, ended up with twice as much. Yeah, so, so but just, I don't think Sadie was saying that. Not necessarily about riches, but am I content? You know, and that doesn't necessarily mean material possessions. But it can't. But it, it can be a, a greed or a covetousness for, for material possessions too. But this, this I, I think the point here was the people are not content. I've been, I've been maligned or I've been a victim or uh, somebody's done this to me or I want this or I want that and I can't be, just say thank you God for what you've given me. Right? In that, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Okay. I see it. <coughs> in all people um, they're just uh, uh, no matter how you know it's they, they, they're just not they're restless uh, they've got to be busy doing something they can't just sit rest. rest yeah yeah, yeah. Um, now we talked about a lot of times tonight that God uses. Now, there's one thing that we haven't talked about that we're going to get into next week, the fear of the Lord, and that there's a time for judgment. There's a time for judgment. So as you read on now in chapter 3 and going into 4, that's where we're lessons at next week, there's a time for all these things, but there's also going to be a time for judgment. And we'll talk about that next week. Thank you. Let's, let's uh, close in prayer here. Any other last comments? Okay. Gracious Lord, we give you praise and thank you again that you are sovereign over the times, over the situations that you bring into our lives. It's hard to see it sometimes, Lord. It's so hard to see it sometimes. And we don't understand why you won't do things or why you do do things in a certain way. Probably not like we'd ever do it, but your ways are so much higher than ours, and we praise you. And we thank you, Lord, for putting eternity in our hearts that we might know you. 
Help us, Lord, to continue to, to strive to know you and to walk with you and to walk in faith and obedience in Christ. Amen.